this is Keena Nisley with The Life of the Land is in its Real Estate. And I am an agent at Keller Williams, but today we have a special guest. We have Vince Gethings from Tri-City Equity here to talk about multifamily investing. Hi, Vince. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, Keena. How are you? Thanks for having me. Hey. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Yeah. So I'm uh, active duty Air Force. Uh, been in for 14 years, a uh, little over 14 years. Um, been investing in real estate for about four years, going to my fifth year of investing. I uh, started investing in multifamily only about three years ago. So I'm fairly new, but um, fairly experienced. It's been, it's been uh, quite of a roller coaster the last three years and uh, lots of scale, lots of growth. Um, and we're looking for a great uh, 2021 going forward and lots of things uh, happening in the market and um, with, our, our, with our company and our, our other groups as well. So great. So what is it exactly that you do? So in Tri-City Equity Group, in that capacity, I, I wear a couple of different hats. Uh, one of the ones is the acquisition director. So I go out and I uh, develop relationships with brokers, do a lot of market research, uh, figure out what markets we're going to go into, why we're going to go into them, uh, what's, I mean, what's the job growth, population growth, income growth, crime rates, things like that um, for all the markets uh, we identify, and then uh, engage brokers in that market, owners in that market of assets that we, we'd like to acquire that fit our, our buying criteria. Uh, and then that's the acquisition side. Then uh, from there, I go into due diligence. I run a lot of the due diligence, uh, negotiating, inspections, dealing with contractors, building up uh, business plans, pro formas, engaging with lenders on you know, getting the, the right kind of uh, lending and debt on these assets. Uh, then once we close, I change seats uh, and put a different hat on, which is the asset manager. And that's where I really thrive. That's my favorite role is being an asset manager. Currently, our portfolio is 290 units, roughly around $14, $15 million assets under management. Um, we close on another property here in uh, about two and a half weeks. We'll add another uh, 50 or so units um, to that portfolio. And we have a, a pipeline full of um, at least two more deals coming down that we're under contract in as well. Wow. So this last year, the real estate market's been quite crazy along with, you know, the COVID-19. So what have you seen, you know, has, has anything changed in the last year? Has it been harder to get properties? How has that been working for you? Oh man, it's been a roller coaster. So uh, let's go back to April of 2020. That's when everything kind of hit the fan, so to speak. Um, so April, 2020, actually this time last year, we were under contract on a 48 unit property in one of our target markets, which is El Paso, Texas. Everything was going smooth Then March hit and everything went crazy. Uh, we ended up um, negotiating that deal because we were almost pulled out of that deal because everything was, the world was ending, you know, March, 2020. Um, and we ended up renegotiating that deal with the sellers and getting ourselves in a really good cash position um, by getting a seller credit. So we had enough cash on hand that we felt very comfortable in um, you know, kind of going through any kind of storm that's gonna come. Uh, we, we had enough cash to like make it a whole year without any income. Uh, so I was like, we're, we're, we're pretty good on that one. So we chose to move forward on that deal. Uh, so the, um, the lending got a lot tighter at the last minute, we're talking 11th hour, the, the lender came back and they said they wanted a $75,000, uh, which is equivalent to about one year of interest reserves on that property. Uh, at closing to go escrowed. So we had to come up with another 75 grand. Uh, so the lending was getting tighter. The uh, seller was getting um, pretty stressed out of, you know, they felt like they were holding a, you know, a time bomb with the world ending and everything like that. Um, so we ended up, you know, staying calm, cool, collected, sticking to our business plan, sticking to our, our criteria, uh, getting really conservative on our underwriting and said, okay, what's the worst case scenario that could happen? Plan for that. Uh, we came up with a solution. We executed it. We ended up closing that deal, uh, and it's that deal actually turned into a home run for us. Um, looking at, at you know pressing one year later, uh, since then we've closed three more deals, all through COVID, uh, and all different different business plans, different scenarios, different markets. One of them was in Michigan. One of them was in Virginia. One of them was in another one of them was in El Paso, Texas. 
and uh, it's been it's been crazy. The lending requirements have you know they they they'll ease up and then go right back into um, as like another wave hits or uh, something like that. So you, the best thing to be is uh, agile, flexible, uh, st stay true to your underwriting um, is another thing that you do a uh, you do a, you build a pro forma, which is like a business plan, your financial analysis. Be very conservative on it, uh, meaning don't don't plan on you know raising rents because we're talking rental properties here. Raising rents, you know a whole bunch of money, like 10%, 20%, keep it very minimal the first couple of years because we don't know what's going to happen. If the deal still works, uh, then you can you can move forward uh, in that deal pretty confident that um, you're not going to end up losing a whole lot on it. So what are you seeing since you are dealing with rentals um, mm -hmm. with this rental moratorium? Do you, yes. are you guys uh, a, a being impacted by that at all? It depends. Uh, so one thing, and I'm pretty good at market research. Um, it's again, one of the hats I wear as, as director of acquisition. And one thing I never really paid too much of attention to was the, um, like the governor's stances on things, uh, the state governor. Uh, it's always been not really, we always look at like landlord tenant laws, like those things are important. Uh, you want to know what you're getting into um, and play out different scenarios that could happen. Uh, understanding the governor's politics has never really been on my radar. It is now um, because I have the the benefit of comparing different uh, different parts of our portfolio. So we have a Virginia portfolio, Michigan portfolio, Texas portfolio, um, and they are apples to oranges. How they how they performed over the last twelve months uh, couldn't be more different. The Michigan one has been impacted heavily on uh, on that. For COVID, the moratorium, uh, our rent collections, things like that. Um, I believe a lot of it, in you know, my opinion, has to do with the policy that was put into place and how the the local governments and the state governments uh, handled that. Uh, Texas, on the other hand, completely different. It, we had the best year ever. Um, very little uh, rents, um, past due balances, and and bad debt. A lot of our tenants communicated a lot better uh, on that property when we had to go and get some relief um for tenants that were affected and or residents that were affected and laid off uh the state was a lot more responsive in, in getting the residents the help that they needed uh there and again they also had the federal moratorium just like everybody else did it was just how it was executed and handled um is completely different so moving forward the lesson in there is pay attention a little bit more to you know who the mayor is look at maybe their, their background who the governor is look at their background because again a lot of real estate investors that wouldn't it would never be on the radar to think of those things. Uh, now, now I look at those things. Yeah, yeah, that's not something I would have even thought of mm -hmm. um, it, with investing or real estate is, is the politics of the area. So how do you, you're in different, different markets. How do you choose a market? So how did you choose to be in Texas and Michigan? And how, how do you choose the market to be in? Yeah, great question. Um, so one of the things, uh, I know, and we're gonna get to this, how am I doing this from Hawaii? Uh, one of the uh, answers for that is a lot of people see being in uh, at Hawaii or out of state, you're looking at out of state investing. It's very a daunting task. But if you switch it to um, as what the benefit of that is, I can go anywhere. If I, if I choose to go out of state, literally, the, I can go to any state. I can go all 50 states. Where if you're stateside uh, on the mainland, a lot of people are like, well, I need to find something in my backyard. And they're, they're very um, kind of they're, they're looking at only like maybe a two or three hour radius. But once you're here and you make the decision, well, there's nothing here in Hawaii that's going to work for my my business plan and my goals. So I'm going to go mainland. Once you make that decision, that mental decision, you can go anywhere. So the entire country is up for grabs. So it, it's um, pretty rewarding to be able to look at all these different markets. So one of the uh, the main criteria I would look for, um, like I mentioned earlier, are population growth, job growth, and income growth. All uh, three of those need to be, you know trending upwards over the last uh, few years. Uh, you, know, you can do look at census data. There's a bunch of resource, uh, resources out there to track that kind of information. Um, all of it's free, uh, but those are the big three. Then I look at things like crime rates, make sure that those are trending down or, or consistently low. Um, and then I look at things like proximity to major interstate systems, uh, major airports, because uh, you want to find places where transportation is good because that'll lead to good manufacturing, uh, good people, uh, good for uh, business travel and things like that. So you want to see the airport is within, you know, 30, 40 miles. That is a pretty decent sized airport. It's a good metric. A lot of people do. 
uh, rail systems with some kind of rail hubs or transportation for manufacturing. Look for those things that drive economic growth uh, or one of the other, as we start getting down to the, the weeds of what I look for. Um, but those are the biggest ones, job growth, population growth, income growth. Uh, once I get through all just the, the, the numbers, the boring side of it, or unless you're analytical, then the very fun side of data analysis, um, then I look for things, okay, what do, what do I have a competitive advantage in these markets? The reason I'm in Michigan, uh, it's a very odd market to be in, um, is because I had a competitive advantage in there. My wife is from Michigan. Her whole family's from Michigan for generations. Even though I've never lived in Michigan, that was a competitive advantage to me when I was starting to get into real estate investing because I could call up my mother-in-law or my, my brother-in-law and be like, I found this property on the MLS. It's a four-unit apartment complex. It's going to be a great property. Um, can you go do a drive-by? Let me know what you think. Or maybe go meet the agent out there. And so I can get you know a different perspective on. So I'm not just getting the agent's testimony of what this property is. I can get somebody I trust. So that was my competitive advantage. Um, not saying agents are not trustworthy. But um, you, know, you know what I mean. So different perspective. And um, that was my competitive advantage. And I bought my first 20 units like that, uh, where I've never actually seen them before I bought them. Um, it was all... all going to a market, I had a competitive advantage in. I, I sent a couple people to the property um, that I trust. They all kind of gave me their story, their testimony on what that property is. I kind of put it all together on my end back here and got a pretty good picture of what the property was going to be and executed on it, bought the property and they, they were great for me while I, while I had them. Wow. So you don't always keep every investment that you buy. Are you, can you go into that a little bit more? Yes. So uh, going back to those properties. So I started investing, I guess we go back to the beginning. So I started investing uh, real estate in 2016, I guess is when I officially would call myself an investor. I did a, what's called the, uh, the house hack. So I lived in a house. I kind of flipped it while I lived in it. And then I sold it um, tax-free because of the whole two-year uh, rule there. So I took that capital and I was like, oh, I want to buy more real estate. That's when I got into uh, um, more education. I was like, I need to learn more about this and find uh, websites like Figure Pockets, online forums, go to local meetups and start figuring out these strategies. At the time, 2016, Figure Pockets was starting to become really big. It was a great resource. It's also 99% free. So um, definitely a good place to start your journey um, without spending a whole lot of money. And you go on Amazon, get a bunch of books as well, uh, which is also very low cost. So my start was getting like duplexes and fourplexes. That's what I knew, those residential properties. I was like, okay, I'm going to get as much of these as I can. So I took that capital from that live and flip. It was about $130,000. It was Bay Area, California, 2016, 17. So kind of like here, you can just buy a property, sit on for a couple of years and make a, a pretty good amount. Uh, so that's essentially um, what happened. Took that and I bought the first 20 units. It was, I think, six properties, some duplexes, some fourplexes equaled up to, to 20 units. Um, and then I started finding the limitations of that strategy. Um, and they hit me like a brick wall uh, and completely stopped my growth. And some of those limitations are um, your debt to income ratio that most people don't think about. So every time you get a loan, you're getting a conventional loan because it's a residential property. So you can get these good conventional loans, 30 year AMs. They sound great until you start stacking them up. And then you go to the bank and they're like, you're at 70% DTI. We're not lending to you anymore. <laughs> and I was like, well, okay. Um, well, I need to solve this problem. And because uh, you know, you're buying them in your personal name, even if you quick claim them uh, into an LLC, the mortgage is still on your name because you got the conventional loan. Um, so your debt to income ratio goes up. That's one of the limiting factors of trying to scale with the small uh, properties. So I was like, okay, I'll refinance them into uh, my business name. The problem with that came, the limiting factor, it was kind of another aha moment was residential properties are valued off of the, the comp value, the comparable value approach. So even though I bought these properties, did a bunch of work to them, uh, these duplexes and fourplexes, when I went to go get the appraisal done, the appraisal came back at the exact price or a little bit over the price I bought it for. And I was like, I did all this work to it. And they're like, that's great, but it's still a comp, you know, comp property. And the only comp is that duplex across the street. And that one's worth 170. So yours is worth 170. I was like, well, I paid 170. They're like, well, what do you want me to do? So I, uh, so that was the other aha moment for me of uh, the, the residential properties, those sub five unit properties are not really the best for scaling 
um, a real estate investment company. That's what your goal is. And we can talk about goal setting and clarity too. Um, but if your goal is to scale a good size portfolio to like replace, say your W2 income, uh, I probably wouldn't do it with duplexes and, and quads or single families because you're going to run to those th issues where you're going to run out of conventional loans. Your debt to income is going to increase where it's going to ruin your personal credibility or credit. Um, and then you're, you're stuck with the comp value approach as well. So that's when I made the decision. That was my, my last aha moment. And I was like, I got to do large multifamily. So back into the books, back into education, joined some groups, um, figured out the whole multifamily thing. And it's been off to the races since then. That was 2018. So 2018 went from 20 units to 290 units is what my portfolio is now. And it's, uh, it's about to double again by Q2 this year. Um, so it's like kind of solving the Rubik's cube. We figured it out, built the systems, built the processes, developed those relationships. And now it's just, um, you know, rinse and repeat, kind of like the first strategy. Yeah. Only with so, so, well, so let's um, step back a minute. And you talked about you're here in Hawaii, but you're doing it on the mainland. So why is it that you haven't invested um, in a multifamilies, multiple doors here um, in the islands? Great question. So I tried looking and, and was quickly realized um, that the re return on the, the properties here didn't meet my goals. So when we're talking about things like cap rate, and I, I know it's um, where you're going to go with that. So the cap rates here are very compressed is the, the terminology that we use, um, the jargon. So, you know, we're talking, you know, two to 3% cap capitalization rates, which is uh, the easiest way to understand that is your cap rate is your, your rate of return if you paid 100% cash. So if you went to a property and bought, you know, this, this apartment building for a million dollars and it was returning uh, income for you, you would get a 2% return on your investment. So that didn't meet my goals. My goals is creating wealth cash flow for my family, financial freedom, quit my W-2 job, 2% returns, ain't going to cut it. Um, so that's when I, you, you evaluate the, the opportunity cost of an investment. And to me, I didn't see the opportunity cost of investing in Hawaii real estate, uh, multifamily, uh, better than if I go stateside, develop a, uh, create a team in a market that's a lot more uh, affordable, the lower barrier to entry, uh, higher capitalization rates, meaning I get you know more return for my my investment, my capital injected, um, and all I had to do was just do a little bit of more work up front, developing a team and a system, a management team on place to execute that. It was well worth it. So that is why I do have some. I have that one single family house over in in Kapolei, um, and it it's doing great as a very long term rental, but it's not something that's going to let me quit my day job. So it's all about what your goal is. Um, and I know a lot of people that do uh, single family rental here or small multi here, and that's great. And that's gonna work well for them, but it just, it didn't, wasn't the tool for me to reach my goals. So, so what, what do you look for in an investment when you're out on the, you know, the MLS or you're looking, what is it that catches your eye? What are you looking for? Inefficiencies. So as a, as an asset manager um, and acquisitions director, I look for properties. So our buy box right now is, um, I'm going to go down real quick and we kind of break it out, is I look for uh, C-class and B-class, value-add, multifamily, anywhere from 50 to 100 units uh, is what our general buy box is. So that generally we're talking um, our perfect deal would be like a 1988, 1990, 100 unit apartment complex in some uh, tertiary market, you know, 20 minutes outside of a big city that uh, some small group bought it or a mom and pop, we call them, uh, bought it. And they're just kind of been trucking along the last, you know, 20 years, but they don't really have any efficient business systems uh, in place. They're kind of just running it as a, almost like their hobby or side job. And you can see a lot of inefficiencies in the way they do management, like rents are really low. Uh, deferred maintenance is kind of creeping up. Um, and that's what we look for is uh, management inefficiencies and, you know, low rents, some deferred maintenance, and we can go on there and we can implement our systems and increase the marketing, uh, renovate the units is something that the, the residents in that community really want because um, they're usually outdated um, units. 
and increase rents, decrease expenses is another big thing I look for. I look at um, profit loss statements and I look for expenses that are just way over what they should be for that market. And that's where I, I kind of cue in there. I'm like, okay, we can shave off 20% here. Their water bill is crazy high. They probably have some leaks they haven't been addressing and things like that. And I can um, increase the value of the property because once we cross over, uh, if you remember earlier, I mentioned the sub five unit uh, properties are called residential. Once you go over five units, it's called commercial and it, they're valued entirely different. Um, and that's where the power and the wealth creation uh, from multifamily really kicks in. So the goal in multifamily is to increase the NOI, the net operating income. And you can either do that by increasing the income or decreasing the expenses. And if you can find a way to do both, you're going to do very well. So we find properties that the rents are maybe $100 below market. So we can bump those up to 100 bucks. And then we find uh, properties where maybe the expenses are 20% over what they should be. So we, we trim them down, uh, get the expenses down to where they should be. And say we add you know $300,000 in net operating income. Well, you divide that or uh, put that on like a six cap or something like that, a six capitalization rate, that could be you know, millions of dollars in value just created by just finding a property that's run inefficiently and getting it tuned up, getting it on par with the rest of the market um, and making a clean, safe uh, place that residents in that community love coming home to every night and creating a community there. And you will do pretty well for yourself and your, your group and your investors if you uh, bring on investors. Wow. So that leads us into um, bringing on investors. How are you funding um, these multi-door investments? Great question. So there's uh, several tools for that as well. And a lot of it is what is the best tool for the job? Um, there's, if it's small, small units, say maybe sub 40, 50 units, we'll do what's called a joint venture where we get a very small group, maybe two, three, four of us, and we'll all chip in, you know, 25%. Uh, down payment, buy the place, put it in our management system and our portfolio and run it. Once we get over that um, maybe 50 unit, 100 unit uh, type place, uh, we bring on other investors. And those other investors come from uh, our personal relationships, uh, maybe your friends, family, coworkers. We have our meetup like the Honolulu Multifamily and More um, or our podcast or other things like this, where we develop relationships with other investors that are looking to get into bigger properties but they, they can't do it on their own. They, they understand the power of the multifamily investing, but they, they see the barrier to entry too high. So they can use us, leverage us and our experience to get into those better class assets. Um, and we can go team up, pull our resource together and buy a, you know, take down a 200 unit, you know, $12 million apartment complex in like, you know, El Paso or Austin or something like that. It's pretty powerful stuff. Wow, yeah. So if one of our viewers is interested in investing, can they do that with you? Or is it something you want a relationship already standing? Great question. Um, so legally, we have to have a, because we do what's called a, so Reg D 506B uh, is the SEC regulation um, for how you can legally um, bring in capital to a deal. So right now I can't, like solicit a deal. I can't say I have, you know, one, two, three main sheet. I need 50 grand. Somebody come get, like that's illegal. I'll be in a red jumpsuit by, or orange jumpsuit by the end of the day um, or whenever they see this. So I can't do that. But what we can do is if you're interested in learning more, we can develop that relationship and it's, it, it takes time, right? Cause we have to have a substantial relationship. We have to make sure um, you, know, you have to kind of see if we're the right fit for you. We have to see if we're the right fit together. Cause it's a partnership. It's not, it's not like going into like Edward Jones or something like that and giving your money to a financial advisor. It's we're going to be in this thing together. We're partners on a deal. Um, that's the relationship you want to build. So we want to make sure we have the same goals. We have the same ethics, values, principles, uh, same timelines. All of that stuff comes into play to make sure that it's almost like getting into a marriage. We want to make sure that we're the right fit because we're going to be tying the knot for five, 10 years as we get into this um, uh, investment vehicle together. So we want to make sure that we have a, a good substantial relationship um, and we're the right fit before you know going into that. So um, if you're interested, the Tri-City Equity Group has a, a, a portal on there where you can contact us and we can just set up a call, go out, go out to lunch, have coffee, and we can start there and, and see where that goes. 
Yeah. So we only have a couple minutes left. So what advice would you give somebody that, that wants to get started? What, what's a couple little pieces of advice? Great question. So real quick, um, if I had to do it again, I would get absolute clarity on what my goal is. Um, I read a book a while back um, and it talks about, you know, people relentlessly work through, through life at whatever their business is, if they're in uh, corporate or whatever the W2 job is, they get to the top of the ladder and they look around and realize it's leaning against the wrong wall, that they, they spent their whole lives or careers getting to the top of this ladder. And it's like, this is not what I want it to begin with in the first place. I want to be over there. So if you're going to get into real estate, um, get clarity on what you got, uh, what you want, what your timeline is, what your actual um, end goal is, if it's a cash flow number, if it's an equity number, net worth number, get clear on that and then figure out what the best tool is to uh, achieve that. Sometimes maybe it will be, I just want to, I'm going to get a pension. We talked about military pensions earlier before the call. I'm like, I don't need a full blown portfolio. I just need something to compensate or uh, supplement my pension. And that might be, you know, five, 10 units where that's where the duplexes and stuff like that would be great. But if I'm trying to replace my income, I need a substantially a lot more than that. And that's where the limiting factor for those properties came in. So get very clear on what your goal is, what your timeline is, why you want that. Like what are the drivers for you achieve, um, to achieve that that's going to keep you motivated to doing it. Uh, and then get started. A lot of people get analysis paralysis. If you're one of those people, join a mastermind, join a group um, of other like-minded individuals. You know, we have the Highland Multifamily More. There's other the, kind of the coaching type groups where you, you pay uh, to get into. Uh, they they're, can be very beneficial as well. But the point is just get into the, get into the game, jump in and get started. Um, I still know people that, that I talked to from 2015 that we're on the same, same path and they're still waiting to do their first deal because they always talk themselves out to it. I'm like, yeah, you, you got to jump in the, you know, the, the ship sailed and, and you're still sitting on the, the shore. So uh, get clear on your goals um, and, and join a group, get educated uh, on what you're doing. Again, there's a lot of resources out there, books on Amazon. There's a lot of coaching groups and, and just get into the game. All right. Well, thank you so much. This was awesome information. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, viewers, for being with us on The Life of the Land is in its Real Estate with Think Tech Hawaii. And I will see you all in a couple weeks. And we're going to have a visit from another lender to kind of understand where the interest rate's going and how is the market right now. So again, thank you so much. This was wonderful. And I will see you all in a couple weeks.